Do you have anything else? I mean, I guess I could just add, uh, for those of you that don't know Kelly, um, Kelly did his PhD in biostatistics at UC Berkeley and then did a postdoc at Harvard uh, with a strong focus on statistical computing, and in particular uh, kinds of big data sets we tend to get in genomics. So I think he's going to be talking a little bit about that today. Um, he started with us over the summer, about seven months ago, and I guess we can keep calling him a new faculty for about a year, and at <laughs> that point we'll retire the new for, for the first year. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, thanks. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, really excited to be uh, presenting here in sort of the full uh, hour-long format. So I've I've talked about this work a couple times in in sort of shorter form, um, but I'm excited. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, sorry, if the people online couldn't hear me. Um, yeah. <laughs> making some adjustments in the room. Um, but yeah, I'm very excited to, to sort of give a little bit of a deep dive into this topic because it's something that I think is very cool and that not a lot of people have heard of. Um, so I'm gonna focus on this and then sort of give a little bit of background on other things that I've worked on, hopefully give a sense for the types of projects that I'm interested in and, and where my expertise lies for those who don't know me. Um, so, I want to start at the very beginning because this is a biostats seminar, not a biology seminar. Uh, what is a T cell? This is this is the level that I had to come into this at. So I'm I'm not going to assume that everybody knows more than I do, even though that's often the case. Um, a T cell is a type of white blood cell that plays an important role in the immune system. Uh, specifically, T cells have T cell receptors that recognize specific antigens. And so you might have a lot of different T cells with a wide variety of T cell receptors that are capable of recognizing a lot of different antigens. And that's sort of a hallmark of, an, of a healthy immune system that is prepared to respond to lots of different threats. Um, this is what the, the T cell receptor looks like. So over on the right in C, um, we've got the T cell receptor, which is you know, a structure on the surface of the T cell itself. And this sort of, this diagram shows how it's made. Um, we've got, <clears throat> over on the left, we start with the DNA. And so uh, we've got what's called VDJ recombination. There are lots of different V and D and J genes that can all go into constructing a particular uh, T cell receptor. And this is how you get such a wide variety of different T cell receptors and how different T cells are able to recognize different antigens uh, is through this VDJ recombination. Um, and it also, I should point out, happens twice because there are two main components here. There's the beta chain and the alpha chain. Um, both of them are formed by recombination and then both of them together determine the specificity of that uh, receptor. So I'm actually going to start with a little bit of a motivating example. Absolutely, please. Um, I don't know about T4 and T8 cells. There are CD4 positive and CD8 positive T cells yeah. are, are the, the types that I'm sort of most familiar with and, and both of those fit under this. They, um, my understanding is that they all have T cell receptors. Okay. Um, I think some of them, you know, they play slightly different roles in immunity, um, but I, I'm not really <laughs> equipped to say what those roles are. Yeah. 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 And at any point, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm coming into this at the lowest level so that hopefully everybody's on board. But like, if anything's unclear, please feel free to interrupt. Um, OK, so why should we be interested in T cells? I'm actually going to take a little bit of a left turn here um, and talk about a paper that I had nothing to do with because I think it's a really cool paper. So this is 
a paper about clustering T cell receptor data. Um, I'm not doing clustering here, um, but they came up with a method for clustering T cell receptors to try to find things that recognize similar antigens um, so that they could sort of start to do community analysis of um, a particular person's or a particular sample's repertoire of T cells. Uh, it's a really cool paper, worth a read if you have time. Uh, the math is beyond me. There's like, I can get 90% of it, but there's that last 10% is completely beyond me. But the cool thing about it is in addition to a clustering method, they also built a query method uh, that's pretty fast and allows you to query a uh, new sample uh, against a sort of database of reference samples. Pretty cool idea. Um, this is a picture on the left representing that database of reference samples that they built. And so you can see that they had patients with a wide variety of diseases. Um, there's a group of healthy controls in the middle. There's COVID-19 and lung cancer patients sort of down at the bottom, all lung related things. Um, there's other types of cancer patients. There's MS. Um, I think that's actually, it. it's just a variety of cancers. Um, but what they were able to do with this data is take new samples or take outside samples that had one of these diseases or didn't and predict what disease they had or didn't. And if you look just at COVID-19 versus healthy control, you can see that they were doing a pretty good job of distinguishing these two. Like, I don't think the little at home rapid tests do as well as this. Um, and it's purely based on a blood draw. This is just, you know, looking at what T cells are present in your blood. Um, so non-invasive and potentially very useful. They really, um, oh yeah, and they, they mention in the paper that this is better than some of the available methods for testing for COVID. Uh, further on in the results and in the discussion, they, they really get sort of, you know, pie in the sky, what's the best possible thing we could do with this? Um, and they talk about developing their platform into a, or developing their system into a unified platform to diagnose infectious disease, autoimmune disorders, and cancers. Basically treating the immune system and what it's doing, how the immune system is reacting, and treating that as a diagnostic tool. Um, they get even more grandiose saying, uh, we could potentially use the immune system as a single biomarker to indicate multiple diseases, shifting the paradigm of diagnosis from symptom driven to immune response driven. And I just think that's a really, really cool idea. Um, as a non-doctor, non non-biologist, I have no idea how feasible this actually is, um, but I ran it past my collaborator, David, who's an MD, PhD, and he said, yeah, that sounds super cool. I have no idea how feasible it is. So we're sort of in the same boat, um, but I think it's really cool. And it's sort of got me you know, very excited about this type of work. Um, so here's some work that I actually did. Um, this is a study of renal cell carcinoma, which is a, a type of kidney cancer. Um, I mentioned my collaborator, David, he was my uh, co-first author on this paper. Um, but this was a big single cell study looking at uh, basically patients that had renal cell carcinoma, a specific type of it, at different stages of disease. So we had a pretty even mix of patients with early stage disease and then locally advanced and metastatic. So three different stages of progression. And uh, this is sort of a targeted uh, assay of the immune system. So we've got mostly immune cells in here. And of those immune cells, you can see a good chunk of them are T cells. And in fact, the sort of main divide here is uh, CD4, CD8 positive. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about T cell exhaustion just so that you have that in the back of your mind. Um, one of the big findings from this paper was this T cell exhaustion phenotype where essentially at as the disease progresses, you see more and more of these exhausted uh, T cells. And so you can think of this trajectory, sort of ignoring the fact that there's two branches, um, 
as a left to right continuum. At the left, we've, that's where we see most of the cells that are from normal samples, meaning you know, healthy kidney tissue. And on the right, uh, you know, we start to see more and more of the disease samples and specifically that metastatic, the most advanced, uh, is sort of the furthest right of any of those. And this just represents, like I said, um, the T cell exhaustion. It's just a way in which the immune system is responding to the progression of this disease. Um, in general, it's characterized by less T cell repertoire diversity. And that's because certain clonotypes, certain types of T cells become clonally expanded. They are sort of deemed important for the body's immune response to cancer. And so they get expanded and it sort of pushes out other things. So you see less overall diversity because the, you know, the immune system is actively responding to a threat. Um, I'm gonna mention here really quickly that this is actually what I'm an expert in. This is the only thing I ever get asked to review papers about is trajectory analysis. So if you ever find yourself wanting to do pseudo time analysis or anything like it, um, I've done a lot of it. Um, but this is really all I'm going to say about that topic. Um, the additional layer of information that we had for this study that was pretty novel at the time and is still, I think, fairly new uh, was the TCR sequencing. So this is a single cell assay uh, where we were able to specifically target the RNA uh, that determines the T cell receptor. And so you can see uh, here in the red are T cells where we detected a T cell receptor, and it was about half of all the T cells that were present in the study. And so this is, you know, like literally on the same cells that we had full expression profiles, we also had this T cell receptor information. Um, and down here, you can just see like little profiles of each patient sample. So for each patient, we had a normal and a tumor sample. And if you squint really hard, um, the, the yellow represents the most expanded clonotype. The purple represents singletons. So clonotypes that were only present in one cell in that patient. Um, the general trend, again, super rough, you really have to squint and want to see it, is that we have less diversity in the tumor samples than in the normal samples. Um, more on that later. So how does T cell sequencing work? Going back to this diagram, it's a targeted sequencing assay of that CDR3 region in the middle of the messenger RNA that encodes the, the T cell receptor. Um, so it's, it's still RNA sequencing, it's still single cell RNA seq in a sense, um, but it's specifically looking at this region of this one particular transcript. And the reason we do is because it captures sort of the, the most variability of these uh, alpha and beta chains. So CDR stands for complementarity determining region. Um, so it's the region that determines what that uh, T cell receptor will recognize, what antigens it will recognize. So it's the most important region, basically, or at least one of the three most important regions for determining uh, the specificity of a T cell. And that's, and it's sort of the most information rich because you can see the other CDRs are only uh, within one of the variable regions, whereas the CDR3 overlaps three variable regions uh, in the beta chain and two in the alpha chain. So we can get quite a lot of information about the specificity of a T cell receptor from this one relatively small region. Um, I'm not gonna get into the like nitty gritty details of how the sequencing works because I don't really understand them, um, but 10X has a pipeline for doing this type of sequencing. So it's pretty standardized. There's you know commercially available kits for doing it. Um, I'm going to jump into the data analysis part because that's where I come into this pipeline. And so basically what you need to know is that the RNA gets collected by the lab uh, and then it gets put through all of the you know, 10X pipeline and they have 
their own analysis methods, um, specifically Cell Ranger VDJ, that builds contigs. Um, contig is going to be the operative word in this output. Um, but it essentially takes all the reads and puts the ones together, if they fit together, into contigs that represent potential CDR3 regions for uh, single cells. Um, this is what that data looks like. And I apologize that it's just a single data frame that had to be run onto three lines. Um, there's a lot going on. It's very rich information. Um, I'm going to try to break it down into just sort of the, the necessary components for you. Um, but the first thing to note is the cell barcode. So not surprisingly, we can get multiple contigs per cell. We would expect two, right? We want one contig that represents the alpha chain and one contig that represents the beta chain. But nothing is ever precise, especially in single cell genomics. So sometimes you get three or four or one or zero or any other number. Um, things happen. So here we've got one with three contigs and another with two. Um, I think the second one is actually a good example because we've got one alpha and one beta. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, they are different. Um, if you look at the CDR3 regions, they're, they're different contigs. Um, this can arise in a number of different ways. Uh, So my understanding and, and sort of David's understanding that he passed on to me uh, is that there's a dominant clonotype for any given T cell, but that doesn't mean that's the only mRNA that it expresses. And sometimes it's just, you know, sequencing error. Sometimes the wrong, uh, you know, an error in the barcode can lead to uh, something being assigned to the wrong cell. Um, with UMI data, which is which this is UMI data, uh, that's a little bit more rare. Um, productive is sort of their best guess as to whether or not this is a real uh, contact, if this is a real uh, chain within a cell. Uh, it encompasses all of the other true-false variables, so is cell high confidence, thought there was one more, but I'm missing it. Um, but basically, this is, do we think this is real? Does it look like it could actually be coding for a, an alpha or a beta chain? So for the most part, we're just going to restrict ourselves to contigs where productive is true, uh, because those are the ones that, that we think are real. Um, chain, we already pointed out, tells us whether it's an alpha chain or a beta chain. That's going to be important, because we know that a uh, T-cell receptor is composed of exactly one of each. Um, and then the CDR3 region is, uh, like I said, that highly variable region in the middle. We're going to focus on uh, the amino acid sequence rather than the nucleotide sequence because it should be the same information. We don't necessarily care if there's a synonymous mutation there. Um, and then just at the very end, some things that are important for sort of housekeeping purposes are what type. So one thing that I haven't mentioned is that B cells have very similar structure to T cells. And this whole pipeline actually applies just as well to B cells. Uh, they're a little bit more complicated because of somatic hypermutation. So they have a different way of determining uh, their, of attaining a wide variety of different B cells. Um, so anyway, most people do T cells because it's sort of the lower hanging fruit. Um, and then sample we need so that we don't mix up cells from different samples. Uh, what do you mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, these are both coming specifically from the, the normal sample from patient 11. And these are just two, you know, this entire table is tens of thousands of lines long. Um, 
So there will be a certain number of cells for each sample. Um, yeah, I think UMIs are probably the more important number there. Um, but that's, like I said, these are contigs, so they're constructed from multiple reads. Uh, so some computation, some, some you know, bioinformatics had to be done already to align those reads and sort of build them into contigs. Um, UMIs tells us how many unique, uh, unique molecular identifiers is what UMI stands for. Um, and it's basically to uh, correct for PCR ampl amplification in order to actually sequence uh, tiny amounts of mRNA, you need to amplify it up a whole bunch. And for reasons that are not well characterized, some uh, strands will take to that amplification better than others, and that can lead to bias in your results. And so a way that, that 10X has sort of found around this problem is using unique molecular identifiers. Each uh, strand of RNA gets assigned sort of a, a 16 base pair random string that identifies that molecule um, so that when they get amplified up, you can say like, oh, these two reads have the same UMI, so they're actually just copies of each other. Is that just like the barcode? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the, the barcode is identifying the cell, and then the UMI is identifying the specific molecule, the specific mRNA. So both of those things get get tagged on um, and sequenced. Yeah, UMI has simplified things greatly in RNA-seq, um, but that's not what this talk is about. <laughs> um, okay, so here I'm gonna uh, simplify things a little bit and cut it down to just chain, productive, CDR3. Um, and give you some examples of cells that we might see. So these are some cells from the real data that we might see, you know, when we're going through looking for, you know, one alpha chain, one beta chain. So this is a great example. This is perfect. Um, we've got one beta, which I'm gonna color in blue, one alpha, red. Uh, they're both productive. So we can, we can say at least, you know, with whatever certainty, the, our best guess is that this is the alpha and beta chain forming the TCL, TCR for this particular cell. Um, great. We've also got cases like this. Um, this is the first one from the previous slide uh, where we've got one beta and two alpha chains, but one of those alphas is not listed as productive. So we're basically gonna discount that one. We're gonna say, We've got one alpha and one beta that are productive, so this is good to go. We can, however, have cases where we've got one beta and two alphas and everything is listed as productive. In this case, it's a little hard to know what we should do with this. Um, so for now, I'm just gonna categorize this as ambiguous. Uh, similarly, we could easily have cells like this uh, where we've only got a beta chain. We've actually got two, but one of them's not productive, so we're just treating it as one. Still not really sure what to do with it. There's no information about the alpha chain in that cell. And then we can have cells where just like all sorts of weird stuff happens. Uh, I don't know how this would happen, um, but IgL and IgH are immunoglobulin light and heavy chains. Those are the components of a B cell receptor. Uh, and they're somehow showing up alongside T cell receptors. So something went weird here. But we do get three productive chains, um, again, a beta and two alphas. So we're going to treat this like we would treat uh, the first ambiguous one over here. But just know that like, there are a lot of different ways in which this data can look weird. And I'm glossing over a lot of them. Um, it, it depends on how you're counting things, um, but in the data that I've seen, which is only you know two data sets from the same lab, uh, if you cut down to just the productive chains, uh, the majority are actually going to be in one of these top two cases. Like the majority 
50, between like 60 and 70% are, are surprisingly in that good category. Um, I'll have a, a figure on that in a minute. Oh, never mind. There's my next slide. It should have just kept going. <laughs> no, it's the perfect segue. <laughs> Um, so this is this is the data from that uh, renal cell carcinoma paper, uh, where I just show like number of alpha chains, number of beta chains. Uh, we've got 67,000 cells that are in that perfect one and one, and then it sort of goes downhill from there in every direction, uh, pretty steeply. So it was a 60. It, it I mean it was almost 100,000 cells, so it was about 67%. Um, is in that range that are in the, the perfectly identifiable one alpha, one beta group. Uh, however, I'm going to go back to that paper that I used as motivation and I'm going to highlight one specific uh, sentence that I didn't before, um, which is that uh, they say for their clustering method that TCRs at low frequencies are potentially important biomarkers. So what we do with these productive, with these ambiguous cells can actually play a big role in the biological conclusions that we draw. So these could be very important. Um, for ease of representation, now I'm gonna switch over to sort of a cartoon format, but just know that I'm still using blue bars to mean beta, red bars to mean alpha, um, but I think this will be easier for describing how we're handling this type of data. Um, so this is again just making the same point as the previous slide. The perfect case is when we've got one alpha and one beta, and that is what the majority of our cells are going to fall into. But there are lots of different ways in which we can be ambiguous, uh, including sort of too little information and too much information. So Thinking through um, how we assign, how we identify clonotypes. Um, if you saw a case like this, where there were three cells that all had the same alpha and the same beta chain, uh, you should absolutely say that these share a clonotype, right? These are the same type of T cell. Um, if we add an extra alpha to that bottom cell, now it's a little bit ambiguous, but it still shares an alpha and a beta combination with these other two. So most likely, these are all the same clonotype. If you had to you know, guess as to what the dominant clonotype was in that bottom cell, you'd say probably the one that we see in other cells. Here, what if we've only got a beta in that bottom cell? Now it's a little ambiguous, right? If the only time we see that beta chain is in these two other cells with that specific alpha pair, then maybe we would say that's the most likely match. But if we see that beta chain showing up in dozens of other cells with lots of different alpha partners, then maybe not. Um, and then here, you know, sort of at the extreme end, we've got three cells that, you know, these two share an alpha, but not a beta. These two share a beta, but not an alpha. These two have nothing in common. This is, I think most people would say three completely different clonotypes. Um, so how do we handle this ambiguity? This is a really important question, especially when we know that those clonotypes at low frequencies can be clinically relevant. And I'm not exactly proud to say we took the easy route in our paper. Uh, we ignored all of the, you know, 30 some percent of the data that was ambiguous. We only took the cells where we had one alpha and one beta chain. And we said, we're just gonna take the low hanging fruit and not worry about the complexity. Um, I'm working on it. But that's what we did when we wrote this paper. Um, another option that has been used by past versions of Cell Ranger. So I, I skipped over this when I talked about the 10X pipeline, but Cell Ranger does actually call clonotypes. However, they just call everything a clonotype. Every combination that you see, they'll call it a clonotype. So if you've got a case like I described before, where we've got two betas and or two alphas and one beta, even if they're shared 
with other cells that have one alpha and one beta, they'll call this a unique clonotype. And so this is important because it actually inflates the diversity. Right? We don't actually have as much diversity in the, the repertoire of clonotypes as you would believe if you looked at this classification. Um, similarly, if you've only got one beta chain, they call that its own clonotype, which sort of breaks the meaning of the word clonotype because now we don't even have enough information to build a T cell receptor. So what does it mean to be calling a beta chain on its own uh, clonotype? It's sort of not sufficient. It, it depends again on what you mean by the word clonotype, but a T cell receptor can only be composed of an alpha and a beta. Um, so the thing that's actually you know, present in the physical world and recognizing antigens can only be a specific alpha and beta. So I don't think either of them are, are meaningful in that way. Um, option three, would I, I'm not even going to get into because I think it's a little too far-fetched, is uh, what I call big tent clonotypes. I've seen this proposed in a paper. They made this figure. Basically, any cell that shares any amount of information with any other cell gets lumped together into a clonotype with that cell. Um, so you get cases like this, which are the, the case that I illustrated earlier. Uh, these two cells have nothing in common, but they're being called the same clonotype because they both share an information with this other cell. Um, okay, so now I'm going to get into what we actually are doing. So let's say we have a case like this where we've got an ambiguous cell that just has an alpha. And we see that alpha in two other places. So we see it in this clonotype with a particular beta, and we see it in this clonotype with a particular beta. Um, we think that sort of the most reasonable thing to do is assign that one cell proportionally to its possible clonotypes. So rather than saying it's its own clonotype or throwing it out entirely, we're going to say it's two thirds clonotype one, it's one third clonotype two, because that's sort of our best guess. That's, that's the maximum likelihood guess based on the information that we have. Um, if we wanted to hard assign it, right, we would say our best guess is clonotype one, but if we really wanted to represent the data that we have, we would do it this way. Um, so this is uh, actually a really classic problem for the expectation maximization algorithm. Um, and I don't know if, so uh, I need to start from the axiom that I just described. Uh, which is that we're defining a clonotype by a single alpha beta combination. We're assuming that each cell has some dominant clonotype. It's only actually constructing one type of receptor. Um, when we see these cells with multiple beta chains or multiple alpha chains, we're assuming that only one of them is actually in use. Um, which again is not my assumption. That was something that was you know, given to me by my collaborator. Um, and if you take that assumption, then this is a classic EM problem. And it's very similar, actually, to RSEM. If anybody is familiar with RNA-seq uh, read alignment, uh, basically the idea of aligning reads to genes in RNA-seq is exactly the same as assigning ambiguous cells to clonotypes in TCR sequencing. And so I'm illustrating that down here. Um, if we've got uh, a T cell, that could be assigned to either of these two clonotypes, and we have no additional information, we would just assign it 50-50. And the same thing if you're doing RNA-seq read alignment, if you've got a particular read that could be assigned to two different transcripts or two different genes, uh, your best guess would be to assign it 50% to each one. Uh, this is the idea behind RSEM, uh, RNA-seq read alignment by expectation maximization. And uh, yeah, a lot of our inspiration for this actually came from RSEM. Uh, similarly, like I said before, it's proportional assignment. 
So if we had four reads that were unambiguously assigned here and one that was unambiguously assigned here, then our ambiguous guy would be assigned proportionally uh, according to sort of how many unambiguous reads there are in each or unambiguous cells. Um, and in cases where one of them has no unambiguous cells, it would be assigned entirely uh, to the, the option where we do see some evidence for it in the data. Uh, it doesn't start out this way. It doesn't immediately go from zero to 100, um, but it's an iterative process. So it actually starts by assigning this read 50-50 and then re-looking at the data and saying, we've got two and a half reads over here and half a read over here. And so it will reassign any ambiguous cells based on those percentages. So then it becomes two and five six on one side and one sixth on the other side and so on until you eventually end up with 99.9% you know, .9 and 0.001%. Um, what this allows us to do is to use more of the data. Like I said, it's 30 you know, some percent more data that we get to now use for the exact same cost, the exact same amount of effort, everything. Like there's no increase in the amount of work that had to be done other than computationally. Um, interestingly, uh, this is two views of a particular sample from uh, the previous study that I mentioned. Um, on the raw scale, it's probably not surprising. Most of the ambiguous reads are sort of going to the most common uh, chronotypes. So we've got unique counts, meaning the count that we get for each chronotype if we only look at the uniquely identifiable chronotypes, and EM counts, meaning the numbers that we get if we use the EM to determine these. Uh, we should always see strictly increasing numbers, right? We're never going to lose information about a chronotype because the EM takes all of those uniquely identifiable cells as a starting point. Um, a lot of them do, a lot of the ambiguous cells do get assigned two very common chronotypes, which is not surprising. But I think if you look at it on a log scale, you see that we are gaining a decent amount of information about these less common chronotypes. And I think that's actually where the power of this uh, is gonna come from, is that we can say a lot more, uh, even if you know we don't have as much confidence as some of these more highly expressed chronotypes, we can say a lot more about what other chronotypes are present at low abundances. And I think that's a really important uh, factor uh, about sort of categorizing and, and classifying the T-cell uh, repertoire. Um, I'm going to mention uh, diversity metrics because there's a lot of different diversity metrics. And this is something that we've actually thought about a lot. We don't have any real results to talk about. Um, but the first thing, and I, I mentioned it earlier when I said, you know, maybe squint at these pie charts. Um, the first thing that a lot of people are going to ask of their data is how, di how much T-cell repertoire diversity do we see? And so there are a lot of different ways to quantify that. And I think it's kind of interesting that actually just counting the number of chronotypes you see is a valid way of categorizing diversity, right? How many different things do I see? Uh, it doesn't take into account sort of the relative proportion of those chronotypes. So things like Shannon entropy or normalized entropy, um, Simpson index or inverse Simpson index, these are all different metrics uh, that attempt to quantify the diversity of a sample. Um, most of them come from the world of ecology and ecological stats uh, and aren't really made for this. There are a few, um, I'm gonna point specifically at breakaway, uh, that are designed specifically for sequencing data. Um, unfortunately, we can't use them with our EM method right now because they're only designed to handle integer count data. Um, but if anybody knows Amy Willis or has any interest in working on uh, diversity measures for non-integer count data, um, that's something that we're, we're currently thinking about. At a population level, 
sure to give pathogens cell diversity. So like if you're doing this in larger scale places, you want to adjust for like antibodies basically. Of like, I don't know, like a HCV or like other providers that like, you know, that's something that you need to adjust for, like, because you would presume if people have been exposed to more viruses, then they right. would have more T cell diversity. Right. Um, not a biologist. <laughs> so my understanding is that um, sort of after you've been exposed to those things and after you, you know, have recovered, um, the immune system goes back to sort of its normal state. It retains obviously some information. Uh, it retains some uh, ability to respond to those things. Like that's why that's what adaptive immunity is. Um, so if you've had vaccines as well, like you could say same thing. Um, I think those those sorts of things would show up in the data, but I think they would be mostly in the the low end. Um, this the stuff. You know, the most prevalent clonotypes are, are going to be the ones that are uh, responding to the current threat rather than, than past threats. Um, but it, it could be, you know, something very interesting to look at. Like, do we see differences between people who have had this past infection or something like that? Yeah, I could totally see it. Like, thinking back to the motivating paper, like, I could be that, see that being a confounding factor for sure. Yeah, because I'm always, like, mixing in, like, COVID. Yeah. Yes. Right. Right. So, yeah, people who had had previous lung infections or something easily could mm -hmm. could play a role there. Um, okay. So, with the uh, concept of measures of diversity in mind, I'm going to go back to this figure, and now we're going to talk about diversity in a much more uh, quantifiable way than just squint at this picture. Um, and basically, uh, if we use uh, the, the method that we used for this paper and that I think is sort of most applicable is normalized Shannon entropy, uh, which handles the non-integer counts very well because it just treats everything as a percentage. Um, what we see is very much in line with what we would expect biologically. And it looks like, I, I'm I almost put a question mark after improved signal on this slide, um, but I think you can say that it's getting better uh, from using the EM as opposed to just the unique counts. So what we would expect to see is essentially as you go left to right from the early stage disease to the metastatic, we would expect to see lower diversity. That was something I said at the beginning when talking about trajectory analysis. Um, and we would also expect to see within the same patient uh, lower diversity in the tumor sample versus the normal sample. And even in the unique uh, quantification setting, that's generally the trend we see. There are definitely some patients that, that break um, the second part of that, that trend. But overall, the average, at least in the metastatic, is lower than the first two. Um, but here, when we use the EM for our quantification, like I think this is just very beautifully shows the three different stages. Um, we've got high, medium, and low, and we've always got that downward trend of lower diversity in the tumor sample. So I think this shows an improvement in sort of the biological, the, the interpretable results. We're getting better science out of better methods. Um, each, each panel is showing four patients, um, and we have two samples from each patient. So the, the samples that are connected by a line are the same patient. Um, and then this is hot off the presses. Uh, I've spent the last semester working with uh, a student here um, who has been working on building a simulation study to show that yes, you do get more information when you use more cells, uh, not totally surprising, but um, basically building as complex a simulation as we could uh, while still understanding the actual true underlying distribution of clonotypes. And then we see how close do we get to that truth using unique quantification versus the EM quantification. Um, 
And so this is just overall distance from the true distribution, which is maybe not the best metric to use. Um, I'm going to redo this with you know, total variation distance and Kulbeck-Weibler divergence and a few other fancy things. Um, but I think this is really cool. And I'm a little bit surprised, actually. I'm not sure that I should be showing this because it seems like these things should converge as you start to get out to the higher sample sizes. Um, even the unique quantification should start to do a good job of categorizing the overall distribution of chronotypes once you get out to you know, 10,000, 20,000 cells. But what we actually see is a consistent advantage uh, from the EM. And I don't have an explanation for that yet because again, I just got these results this morning. <laughs> but I thought it was really cool, so I wanted to include it. Yeah, I think um, I think within a you know within a method, I think that makes sense, right? Sometimes you get better or worse, but like there's some truth, and you're hovering around it. Um, yeah, I, I think this points to maybe an upper limit on sort of this is as close as you can come using this method, and this is as close as you can come using this other method. And so I don't know. Hopefully, that's that's what I want this to mean. <laughs> But I need to look into it in much more detail to, to really figure it out. Um, and then I'm just going to point out that VDJ Dive is the package that we made that implements these methods. So if by chance any of you have TCR data that you want to try this out on, um, it's on Bioconductor. It's ready to go. It's brand new, as you can see. Um, hasn't been in there very long, less than six months. Um, but it's out there. If people want to try it, we're very confident, for the most part, in it. Um, we made some cool stickers. If anybody wants stickers, they're in my office. Um, yeah, and I'm just I'm working on the paper now. Like I said, the simulation results just got done today, and we're probably going to have to redo them a few different ways. But I think it's very exciting, and I'm, I'm happy that I was able to talk about it with you. Um, so I want to thank. The people that I worked with on this project. Um, David Braun is my fantastic collaborator, who's an MD PhD. He's now a professor at Yale, um, but we intersected at Dana Farber while I was a postdoc there. Uh, Jill and Mercida uh, were my fellow postdocs in the Rafa lab. We all sat down one day and were like, we should work on a project together. What should it be? And this is what we landed on. Um, so this has been, I think, the three of us were sort of the core stats team on this, and it's been a joy to work with them. Um, and Mingji Yi uh, is the student that I mentioned earlier who has been doing fantastic work on implementing the simulation study, um, really getting it um, sort of to run in reasonable human scale amounts of time because I was not having any luck with that. Um, so yeah, I don't know what time it is. Oh yeah, all right. I don't think I have enough time to get into another topic. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it here <laughs> if anybody has any questions. Um, for the actual analysis, it's not too bad. Um, running the, the EM quantification on sort of the, the data sets that we've gotten takes about an hour. Uh, on, and that's on a laptop, so it's not too bad. Um, is this going to be tied at all to the We're not using them, but I don't know enough to say that they are unrelated. There, there could be methodological similarities there that I'm, I'm missing. Um, what did I say? We've got about 67,000 cells, so that was the number, yeah, 67,000 cells was the number of one and one, so about 100,000 cells. The simulation takes longer um, because I could not find a way to, yeah, 
whatever. I couldn't find a good way to do it in R. Mingji implemented it in Python, and it runs much faster now. So we just actually generate all the data in Python and pass it over to R, uh, which is interesting because the way that VDD dive works is by actually passing all the work to Python. So really, this is just a Python project masquerading as an R project. <laughs> Um, this one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. T cell exhaustion um, was sort of one of the things that we saw in the data as sort of a, a phenotype that was indicative of the, the immune response to cancer. And so um, that exhaustion phenotype was associated with decreased. Uh, diversity. And so we would expect to see it more in the metastatic samples, and we would expect to see it more in the tumor samples than the paired normal. Yeah. Yeah, every, every, um, every pair of dots is a different patient. So the lines connect the same patient um, to itself. And for each patient, we've got uh, a sample from the tumor microenvironment and from sort of adjacent normal kidney. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think also, you know, attributable to advancing disease stage. Yeah. Yeah, I want to find it here. But yeah, um, looking at, at sort of the uh, T cell exhaustion progression, it's definitely the case that we see more of the T cells from the normal, the adjacent normal samples in the early sort of non exhausted phenotype. And then as we move to the right, we see more and more uh, of the exhausted T cell phenotype, especially in the metastatic samples. Yeah. Yeah, it's the same data in all two ways. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um my, it is an answerable question, and I don't, I don't have the answer for you, but I do have a pretty good guess, which is that it's based on, on how many reads, how many cells we got from that patient. So this, it's, it's a very non-standard distribution. Like it's not like we get an equal representation of each patient. So I'm guessing the ones where we see the biggest changes are the ones, you know, like S16N here, where almost 50% of the data was was being thrown out. Yeah. Um, I, I think it varies by the number of cells that were picked up. I, I don't know that it varies by stage. I, I could look into that. Yeah. Actually, I would expect there to be less ambiguity in the advanced stages because there's more dominance by a small number of chronotypes. So 
That would be my guess. Right. Doesn't look like there's any questions, but thank you very much, Kelly. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks.